听得到我讲话吗？可以听见，可以听见。啊 ，Hello， 哎 ，Professor Parker， 好 ，Let's start the meeting， OK？ OK。Good morning, everyone. Welcome all of you to participate the international workshop on uh, heterogeneous edge computing for embedded system (HEC) in conjunction with the top rank academic conference in the field of embedded system (ES) week. The online meeting room is maintained by the volunteer from May conference (ES) week. Based on various of IoT devices or local edge nodes, which, which provide strong capability of heterogeneous computation, edge computing becomes a distributed computing framework in the past few years, especially the mobile computing devices, self driving, autos, servers, robots. Are imagined as the future applications supported by the edge computing, then would bring much more convenience to people, even change modern lifestyle. Today, we are very grateful to invite six excellent scholars and engineers from industry and academia who are working on heterogeneous computing. And an edge computing system, they are respect, respectively from Korea University, SAT of Chinese Academic of Sciences, Percept Ad Company, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, Donghua University, and the University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Let's welcome the first speaker. The topic is smart access edge computing system and federation. Before he start his wonderful talk, let me briefly introduce the professor Shanghai Park. Shanghai Park received a PhD degrees from Shuai University, National University in computer engineering in. 20, 2005, from 2005 to 2006, he was a postdoctoral fellow with a broad band of communications research group in University of Waterloo, Canada. In 2007, he joined the faculty of Korea University, where he is currently a professor in the School of Electronic Engin Engineering. He was granted a lot of awards and served as a lot of academic volunteers. He is a senior member of IGP. His research interests include software, networking, 5G and 6G mobile core networks, mobile edge computing, programmable data plane, and vertical networking. Let's welcome the Professor Park again. Professor Park, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, please start your talk in 30 minutes. Okay. So thank you very much for your kind introduction. I will share my screen. Great. Is it okay? Yes, okay. Please start. Okay. So thank you for inviting in this the uh, good workshop, international workshop on heterogeneous as computing for embedded system. My name is Sang Hong Baek from Korea University. Uh, currently I'm working on the network software realizations and the MEC topics. Uh, also, I'm serving as um, the, the chairman for service and ecosystem in MEC Forum in Korea. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the ecosystem and federation issues in MEC. So my talk title is the 
multi access as computing ecosystem and federation. So this is the outline of my talk. I briefly introduced the, the key concept of the MEC and its use cases and taxonomy. Right? And then I will talk about the MEC ecosystem by introducing the key players in MEC ecosystem. And then uh, I will discuss the, the federation issue, issues between the MEC the provider or operators. So I'm sorry this is the, uh, the materials in Korea, but uh, it's very simple or illustrative, the materials. Right? So this figure shows the, uh, the famous restaurants located in the rest areas on the highway. For example, this is the map of Korea. So let me see. Uh, so. Uh, this area is the Seoul, as you know. Right? This part is the Busan. Yeah. So if you want to go to the uh, Busan from Seoul, you may use the uh, number one highway from Seoul to Busan. Right? In that case, you can stop by the, for example, the Hanam resting rest areas the, so in these positions. So as shown in these figures, the, uh, the ginseng, ginseng, the the uh, Garbi Su is famous in the Hanam rest areas. In, in other cases, if you want to go to the east, the coast areas uh, located here, you may stop by the Hwangsong rest areas. So in that case, you can enjoy the, the steak the, from the Hwangsong. Hang, hang, right? In this manner, you can enjoy different kinds of the famous foods in the resting areas. However, as I'm living in the Seoul, so in that case, it is not easy to visit the Hwangsong or Hanam without going to the Busan, right? In that case, we can consider it on different approach. For example, that this figure shows the, the nearest the resting areas to Seoul, that's called the Seoul meeting places, right? Uh, it's very close to Seoul. Uh, for example, it takes just 10 minutes from my home, right? So let me assume that the, this, the famous foods such as the ginseng soup and the steak uh, can be provided by the Seoul meeting places. You can enjoy, you can enjoy the very famous foods in different areas without going to the actual places. In this manner, the MEC provides the, the low latent services. Typically, the, the data and applications may located at the cloud service. However, it takes a long time to visit the cloud service, and we have some privacy issues to deliver the very sensitive data from devices or the local places to cloud or remote areas. In that case, the MEC will be promising solutions by reducing the latency and the, by, pro, uh, by providing the, the privacy issues. So this table shows, summarizes the MEC use cases, including smart home, smart city, the remote surgery, AI VR service, and so on. So depending on the use cases, we have different types of data and different uh, data capacity and the different requirements the back core connectivity and expected latency and the number of devices. So this is another tables that depending on the use cases, the, their the requirement. For example, let me consider the smart home scenario, right? In the case, we have the local MEC servers located in a smart home. Uh, in the case, compared to other services such as AR, VR, gaming, uh, smart home applications are not quite sensitive to latency. So in the case, we cannot, uh, we, we do not call it, uh, consider the low latency requirements. On the other hand, in smart home, you may enjoy some of the high volume or the multimedia service. In the case, we need to consider the increased bandwidth and some contents awareness or fixed uh, wire support and so on. On the other hand, the augmented reality service, AR service is sensitive to the latency. In the case, we need to, we need to consider the more requirement, including low latency and security, privacy and mobility issues. So in this manner, it depends on the image use cases, we have different requirements. 
So in the literature, there are intensive research work to address the, the previously mentioned the requirements of MEC services. For example, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, in that researches, we need to consider different attributes, such as latency or loca location awareness and traffic distribution and volume. Also to optimize the, the performance, we need to consider the different performance measures, such as operation cost, uh, QoS and energy efficiency. In terms of the op uh, optimization objectives, you need to consider data management or QoS service or network demands or the location awareness and then resource management and so on. Uh, today's talk, I focused on the, the first part, this part, federation, right? So depend, uh, actually the, uh, there is the initial stage on the MEC federation because the many MEC operators, mm -hmm. More specifically, mobile data operators are very interested in the federation issues. So, uh, I will, uh, in later, I will talk about the, some standardization or the, some, the, some alliance, the, the progress regarding the MEC federation issue. Uh, before moving to MEC federation issues, I will define the MEC ecosystem. Right? So actually, I'm working on the communication or networking areas. So I focus on the communication or networking infrastructure. Right? So as shown in this figure, we we have three players. The first one, the infrastructure provider, denoted by LMP. The second one is the edge platform provider. The third one is the contents provider. As its name implies, the infrastructure, MEC infrastructure providers, uh, provides on the communication network infrastructure as well as the computing infrastructure. If you are focusing on the communication or network infrastructure, we can consider the two big the standardization bodies, such as the 3CPP and ETSI. As you know, 3CPP defines the 5G network architectures. On the other hand, ETSI or S defines the uh, network function virtualization or the the MEC, multi-access computing based on the uh, NFV platform, framework uh, defines, uh, defines the, the MEC platform. Right? So this is the, the specification title. So in this manner, the, the gray areas use the 3GPP core network or 3GPP 5G system. There is the uh, proposal to inter, in, integrate the 3GPP 5G system and the uh, ETSI uh, the MEC framework. I will talk about the, the details then later. Above the infrastructure providers, we you can consider the different the SG service platform, SG platform provider, right? So there is the very the high competition among different bodies. The first one is uh, actually this figure is based on the the Korea and USA case, but I believe that the, the almost the same situation in China, right? The first edge platform providers are mobile net operator or telco, right? So in Korea, we have three big uh, mobile net operators, such as the SK Telecom, KT, and U Plus. So all of them tries to provide MEC service based on their infrastructure, their 5G or 4G infrastructure. Also, in, in, in the case of USA, AT&T, Sprint, or Verizon are trying to provide the edge service based on their infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, cloud service providers, the big three companies are Amazon Web Service and Microsoft Azure Service, Google Cloud Platform, uh, provide the di different types of services that can be used in uh, MEC scenario, right? So Amazon provides the uh, different the portfolios for MEC service on premise service or the individual, the SG cloud and so on. So there is a strong tension between mobile net operators and cloud service provider, right? I'll discuss the, this topic in later. The middle one is open source. Actually, this is not the operator, but it provides the software platform uh, based on the open software or open source system, right? Including Linux Foundation or Open Network Foundation and so on. 
above the edge platform providers, we have you can consider the uh, different application, the different the MEC based or MEC empowered uh, application, such as contents provide uh, content distribution network, interactive game, AR VR service, live streaming or video conference service, or autonomous vehicle service, and so on. Right? In today's talk, I'll talk, I focus on the edge platform provider and infrastructure provider. So the next one is the, the more details on infrastructure provider. So as I mentioned before, we have two standard bodies, the 3CPP and ETSI MEC. In the case of ETSI MEC, which is based on the NFV framework. So we say the actually the MEC is a, a special use case of NFV. So the infrastructure is virtualized and the Based on the management of the frameworks, the virtual, so virtualized resources will be allocated for MEC services. In case of 3CPP, uh, which defines the, the 5G, including the 4G, uh, the uh, network infrastructure, uh, there are uh, different groups. The, for example, SA2 defines the whole 5G system, including 5G mobile core network. So we have some specifications such as 23.501 and so on. On the other hand, SA6 focuses on the low return services over the 5G infrastructure. So one of the key activity of the SA6 is to define the edge application, uh, which is the name of the MEC services in CSPP. So uh, SA6 defines the all kind of the interworking architectures for enabling the uh, MEC or edge applications over the, the 5G infrastructure. This is the, the case of the inter integration cases between the ETSI MEC framework denoted by the uh, green colors and the 3CPP 5G core system uh, denoted by the gray one. So in this mentioned in the figures, the U is just the usual equipment of devices RAN, radio access network, the base, base stations. UPF is the key element for MEC service or edge service because all traffic from user equipment or devices will go to the base station, RAN, LAN, and go to the UPF. At the UPF, the traffic can be classified and the classified. Uh, for conventional internet services, the traffic will go to the data network, DN, or public internet. On the other hand, for MEC services, the traffic will be classified at the first UPF, and then it will be forwarded to lower part in this case, right? because the, these green areas provide MEC servers or MEC platform. So MEC traffic will, will be forwarded to lower another UPF, and then it will be processed by MEC platform defined by the ETSI MEC framework. Also, we require some, some service orchestrator or manage, for management. In the case, we need to interwork between any app. Any app defines, uh, stands for Neto exposure function, so which is key element to interwork with the uh, external services <clears throat> in 5G. So there is interworking between the any app and the ETSI MEC orchestrator. This is one of the proposal of the ETSI MEC and 3CPP 5G core. So as I mentioned before, 3CPP SA6 defines the edge application, which is the new introduction of the MEC service in 5G. So at, actually, the, uh, we have the, the uh, UE, user key mode and CCP core network previously mentioned. At the same time, we, uh, SA6 introduced edge data network. Uh, overall structure is very similar to ETSI MEC uh, because it uh, includes the edge application server, edge enabler server, and edge computer server, right? So SA6 defines different interfaces between the 3GP core system and edge data network, such as the edge one interface, edge two interface, and so on. So this is the case of the infrastructure provider. On the other hand, let's move to the, the middle layer or the edge platform provider. 
the person is a mobile network operator, right? So in that case, mobile network operator or telco will build up uh, their own edge platform. So in other words, the mobile network operator can provide on-premise services the, for mobile edge services. Then, then what is the key advantage of the on-premise services or edge platform or mobile network operator? The key advantage is that the mobile network operators is the uh, reach of the infrastructure for edge computing. So um, mobile network operator is the, uh, can provide the uh, mobile network operator specific edge services. For example, is the mobile network operator can uh, obtains the location information of uh, user equipment or devices. So location dependent or location aware and the services can be easily provided by mobile network operator. Also, the mobile network operator can handle the network QoS. Right? So network QoS, the provisions, the MS services can be the best provided by mobile, mobile network operator. So this is the case of the SK Telecom. So this is the 5G users and MEC on-premise the active platform. Uh, by the way, at the, the as MSP for mobile network operator build up is building up the uh, their own edge platform. At the same time, they are closely they work with the cloud provider. So in, as shown in these figures, SK Telecom uh, built the, its own MSP platform. At the same time, it uses the AWS wave bank solution, right? Because the, in other words, there are two tracks. One is for its own on-premise service. Another one is the public, the MEC cloud service. So this is the, the second case of cloud service provider. So as you know, do we have, uh, such as Amazon or Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and Google are very interested in the MEC service. So they are, uh, deploying the uh, uh, numerous the edge data centers. Also, at the same time, as shown in the previous slide, there is the collaboration with the mobile network operator to to get the to access the the user the the more the uh, more the edge the uh, edge site. Then, what is the key advantage of the the uh, edge platform? at a platform provided by cloud service provider. The key advantage is the consistent interfaces. Right? So in the case of the application, I'm sorry. In the case of the uh, cloud service providers, application providers, the, uh, if the some service or application is running over the AWS cloud service, the service can be easily migrated to edge cloud platform because the, the AWS, the cloud service and the cloud platform and AWS, the edge platform will use the, the same interfaces. This figure shows the tight collaboration between the AW, uh, Microsoft, AWS, Google, and some of the mobile net operator, including AT&T, Verizon, and SK Telecom and so on. Uh, and there is the, the very complicated the relationship between the uh, cloud service provider and mobile network operator. Then, as I mentioned before, there is a tension between mobile network operator and cloud service provider. So the, these articles, these news articles, uh, indicate that the mobile network operator is better than is better than cloud service provider to, in providing the MC service because. In the case of AT&T, as you know, there's a big company, big tele, uh, telecos in USA, has the 6, 65,000 cell towers and roughly 5,000 uh, central office. And all these places can be used for edge computing size. In other words, mobile net operators have a reach of the cell site and cell site can be used for edge computing size. Right? This is a big advantage to provide ME service because ME service requires the, the proximity service. On the other hand, cloud service providers uh, do not have any cell site for providing ME service. However, is that these articles, uh, these news articles uh, mentioned that Amazon acquires the 
coal put market in USA uh, using the $13.7 billion. It means that, as you know, the Amazon is the online commercial service provider. However, the, by acquiring the whole food market, it, it, it has the, now the, the offline the site. It means that the Amazon can use the whole food marketplace, the physical whole food marketplaces as, as competing sites. Right? In other words, the, there is the, 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 the competition and collaboration and tensions between the mobile net operator and cloud service provider. In terms of software platform, we have the different choices. The first one is the, the Star, Star, uh, Starlinks, the, uh, which is provided by OpenStack Foundation. The next one is the Akrino Edge Stack, which is uh, provided by Linux Foundation Edge. So hitting uh, the different components such as ARM, at and Intel, Huawei are involved in Linux Foundation Edge. The third one is the Edge open edge computing uh, that's the led by the, the some, oh. some university uh, just uh, Carnegie Mellon University and Microsoft uh, sorry and VML and Intel also the open networking foundation uh, which defines this some of these SDN and NF free based on framework, Ether and the Cord and XOS that, that, that defines the uh, MEC service, the framework and the access technology and orchestration technology and so on. Uh, recently, the, the MEC services that is based on uh, can be provided over the uh, container. So Kubernetes is a new approach to define the MEC framework based on the Kubernetes. The next topic is uh, MEC federation. Uh, previously, I have analyzed the, the pros and cons of mobile network operator and uh, cloud service provider in providing the MEC services. So in, the, in, in case of the mobile network operator or telcos, has a big advantage of the uh, numerous uh, cell site or MEC cell site. However, the it is not easy to provide a consistent interface or a consistent API to application provider. Let me assume that there is the, the MEC application provider. Right? Uh, the company developed one application or service, and then the service has been launched over the SKT, SK Telecom MEC framework. Uh, in that case, the MEC, uh, SK Telecom users can enjoy the MEC services. However, the other the companies such as KT or U Plus or at and in USA uh, cannot enjoy the MEC services because the SKT may use the different interface or different framework for MEC services. So therefore, there is a very high interest for uh, federation between among different the mobile network operators. This is the result of the MEC federation. So GSMA is the, the alliance, alliance of the um, uh, key mobile network operators such as the SKT, Verizon, and Sprint and so on. They released the one uh, white paper on the federation issues. Also the ETSI is interested in defining the interconnection or federation framework, the two different image framework. This is the, the case of GSMA. OP stands for operator platform. So this is the key element for uh, MEC federation. Right? So in this figure, it's the UE is the devices, devices, and this is the operator platform. This is a key element for federations, which defines the different interfaces to application provider, northbound interface. Also, it can handle the cloud resources or network resources by means of southbound API. At the same time, the operator platform for example, the operator platform of SKT can interwork with the operator platform of at and by means of the east and west uh, westbound interfaces. In other words, the operator platform so provides some abstract uh, functionalities for uh, MEC federation. 
uh, also there is another proposal of the ITOT. So this is standard body, standardization body, similar to previous operator platform. It defines the, uh, the image measurement layer platform and infrastructure layer. So to federate these two different the MEC frameworks, the MEC aggregation layer has been introduced for federation. ETSI provides the, the interworking functions by introducing the MEC federator, this part, right? The left side uh, part shows the conventional MEC framework. So by means of the MEC federators, the, the deep two, two different, two different Two different mobile network operator can interwork. Uh, their MC framework can be interwork. So the this paper, the uh, as mentioned in this in the below, this paper investigated the different aspects uh, for MC federation uh, in terms of business implication and technical implication. So in case of the, uh, of course, the, we need to handle the, some technical issues. As I know, the previous mentioned, the JSMA, ITUT, and ETSI are working on the some technical issues. The key issue is the common abstract model. As I mentioned before, the key issues in MEC Federation is how to make common interface between two different operators. So we need to define the common abstract model for each federation. Also, the, the service or domain discovery functionality should be provided because the, uh, the provider A does not have any specific information, the uh, providing uh, services or the domain in the uh, other do the service provider B. Also, there's some there are- Excuse some... me, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Professor yes. Parker, uh, 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 about you. So you just have one minute left. Yes, this is less than right, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So in terms of technical issues, we need to consider service decomposition and multi-domain extensions. Except that these the technical issues, we need to handle the business the, the issues, such as the how to pricing the uh, to federate the services or how to make a, a, the reasonable subsurface agreement and so on. Okay, this is the conclusion. So as I mentioned before, the MS Federation is a new topic of that's a very important topic because the, by means of the MC federations, the mobile net operator can provide homogeneous and interworked framework for MC services. So Kamala is a new project, uh, the Telco Global API alliance, or Alliances, which includes a GSMA operated platform. So different the telcos and the cloud service providers are working on the MC to address the MC federation issue. Thank you. This is the end of my talk, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Parker's great speaker. I uh, expect to uh, meet you in Shanghai face to face in the near future. But today, sure. as, as you know, due to the limited time, we have to uh, uh, start directly to the uh, second report. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. Um, the uh, next report, uh, the topic is trusted execution environment on heterogeneous edge computing. Let me uh, briefly introduce Professor Wei Yan. Wei Yan received the master's degree in electronic engineering at the University of Chinese Academic of Science. Uh, in 2014, and a PhD degree in, in, in uh, electronic and computer engineering at the University of Connecticut in uh, 2018. After being a postdoctoral research at the Washington University in uh, St. Louis and the assistant professor at the Clarkson University, he is currently an Associate Professor in Institute of uh, Computing Technology, uh, Chinese Academic of Sciences. His research interests include FPGA-based digital design, hardware, and embedded, embedded uh, security, fault tolerance, ter uh, tolerant, 
uh, algorithm, blockchain, and solid state devices. Uh, Professor Yan, are you ready? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Please uh, start your talk in 30 minutes. Um, let me share my um, let me share my screen. So, so let me have some issue with that. Um, give me a second. All right, let me try it again. Um, Some issue with the. Um, here we go. Um, okay, uh, you can yes. see the right. Yes, yes, great. Okay, okay uh, it's my great honor to be invited uh, for this talk. And uh, my name is William from Institute of Computing Technology, um, Chinese Community of Science. And uh, today, uh, because I'm a security guy, I want to talk about uh, something related to security. Uh, my talk should be short and sweet. So, uh, as we know, uh, lightweight devices, uh, IoT devices, actually suffering from lots of um, attacks in the cloud and the age. And while I was uh, working in the Comcast, it's a, a uh, USA, um, uh, it's a USA company, um, and uh, we actually explore lots of uh, attack uh, methodologies such as the hyper trojan, the side channel, uh, foot injection, buffer overflow, and uh, uh, also uh, in the near future, I think uh, the uh, quantum computer is uh, still a big risk for the um, for the IoT devices. So. Um, so talking about the uh, the challenge of heterogeneous edge computing, we have to um, try to secure two parts. One is the uh, system, and the other one is the user data. So for the system level, we have to like um, find a secure container or some uh, or sub box to um, to um, put the malicious code into it, so the malicious code won't affect the other cores or other processors or other machine. Um, and on the other side, we also need to consider some privacy, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, privacy preserving issues. And uh, when um, people use the IoT devices, for example, a, a, a children use the IoT toy and he may uh, leak his name, um, address, and some other sensitive uh, sensitive information of uh, his parents. So uh, we have to find a way to secure the data in the meanwhile. Um, this is a security issue and uh, um, definitely people find uh, two methodology. One is the isolation to um, secure the code and system and the other one is the crypto um, for uh, like AES, RSA, which can um, encrypt the data. Uh, so uh, people can um, can um, um, uh, can build a secure system with some cost, and this cost could be the uh, uh, virtualization or isolation of uh, some uh, very heavy um, um, burden privacy uh, preserving algorithms, such as the full of encryption. And uh, so far, it's not whole story yet. We have to think about the bottom level. When we look at these uh, processors, we may have Intel, ARM, um, AMD, and RISC V. And this um, hardware provide the, the heterogeneity um, for us. Um, and this kind of uh, this is. Uh, kind of difficult to uh, do the hardware software co-design because we have to find a way to you uh, let the hardware provide the software with the um, environment abstract and well we have to uh, find a way to use the software to provide hardware with a uniform interface so things can be uh, quite complicated um these are the uh, we, we try to highlight some um, uh, security challenges related to the um the heterogeneity of the IoT system in the uh, edge computing. And uh, basically we need to find a way to solve the, the heterogeneity of the uh, processors. So uh, the, the simple solution is um, just, the, uh, just the execution environment that we, we call it TE for short. And TE is a secure area of the processors. It's not just about the hardware or the software, but it's about the whole system. Um, we basically have the rich world and a trusted world. And in this trusted world, we were able to um, 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 contain 
the uh, yeah, contain the, the code and data with uh, with uh, with some secure methods so that we can keep the confidentiality and the integrity. So this is the um, big picture of the TE. And uh, right now we have different kind of TEs. For example, uh, uh, Intel SGX, AMD container, um, um, uh, IBM container, AMD SEV, um, uh, a Risk of Fire Keystone, and the Arm Trust Zone. And for Intel SGX, it's a um, perfect hardware design, but uh, um, it's too complicated. Um, for the container, is um, for the container and the SEV, they are um, pure, uh, they are also pure software solution. And if you look at the Risk Five and the Arm Trust Zone, they they are hardware related. And uh, so if you look from the um, right side to the um, right side to the left side, and uh, these are the um, these are the um, cross graded and. Uh, uh, this is the fan grid. So all of them has their own issues. How, how can we solve the problem? Actually, there are some um, solutions provided by um, several research groups. For example, this one is the first scenario that we try to communicate between the, um, 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 it's, it's, it's about the endpoint um, security. And uh, people use the heterogeneous architecture with the TE processor and a coprocessor um, to, um, to secure certain parts, and uh, uh, in in this in this paper, um, people um, provide a solution called the isolated subsystem, which can um, which can provide the TE with isolated root of trust, and uh, they can also provide the key management scheme, also the two channel um, TRNG. So basically. Uh, the TE processor can raise everything. Um, these common professors, uh, professors for, for example, the PC, uh, PC, PCIe, DDR, and other stuff. Um, but its bus cannot, um, with, cannot communicate with the isolated bus. So this, uh, this is their solution to um, provide the secure boot and the root key. And the second scenario is between the um, between the edge and the cloud. So we we. Uh, we can assume that we have a distributed cloud um, storage, and uh, we have the uh, some uh, server provider which has a strong Intel SGX, SGX TE. Well, some other users may have some simple ARM trust zone, so they can still build a, a secure channel which focuses on the secure logging infrastructure um, that uh, is is to uh, reduce the risk of the key exposure, some malicious activities and other behaviors. So their idea is to um, use the decryption key to, um, to contain a log access permission. And this uh, log access permission was able to control the uh, access um, privilege uh, for these logs. So that's another story. Um, for the third part, I think it's about the the um the TE in the cloud. So um basically this this, this work provides um uh, a solution between the CPU and the GPU communication uh, to solve the set, set channel problem. And uh, first uh, they provide a data center level TE for some uh, confidential computing. And second they try to um use the secure mode uh, switch uh, between the secure world and the insecure world, so that we can um, uh, we can easily use some accelerator to um, um, to 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 uh, process secure data. Well, for some other part, we can use the accelerator to um, process the um, ins insecure part. And uh, still, I think we still have some challenge for the heterogeneous TE in the edge computing. Um, the first one is. Um, how can we find um, a solution for the root of trust and uh, key, management, uh, key management policies based on different um, platform, which may lead to insecure attestation? And second one is, um, let's think about uh, if we use the uh, enclave to, um, um, to, um, to uh, secure every progress, and uh, it's, not, it's not efficient, and it's pretty difficult for some lightweight IOTs to uh, install a, a very secure TE. And third part is very hard to communicate between the heterogeneous hardware TE and the host applications. 
Um, we, 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 I, I think for, for my opinion, the simple is best. When we look at the, at the Intel SGX, it's too complicated, uh, which means there could be uh, many, back, uh, many backdoors um, for attackers. And uh, for heterogeneous system, I think uh, we should make it as simple as possible to make it more secure. Um, so the first thing is, uh, it's just some open questions, but I want to like, um, um, bring some light for that. Uh, is the uh, word, uh, it's a virtual TPM with the physical and global functions for the enclave attestation. The second one is the uh, flash based uh, enclave initialization. And the third one is the uh, 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 some universal TE interface for the uh, interaction. So the first one is about uh, physical and global function. It's a unique um, hardware entity that we can, um, we can leverage. Um, uh, for the um, um, some um, uh, chip identification, key generation, and other progress. It's the, uh, when we fabricate the chip, it will generate some uniqueness, randomness, and uh, it will provide uh, some hard, uh, hash function features. So it has a um, two special features, one is unpredictable and the other one is unclone. So, I uh, might give uh, the different challenges to the one path and the, we can receive different uh, um, responses, even there's only one big difference in the challenges. And the second one is about uh, uniqueness. When we um, provide uh, the same challenge, different paths, they provide different uh, responses. Um, and third one is the stability. Um, this is um, this is not 100% true, but at least I think for like 90 uh, 90% um, bit would be would be the same given the same challenge and the same path. So with the path um, hardware um, uh, primitives, we were able to build a trusted platform module uh, with more strong security features by embedding the paths. Um, so we we're trying to like simplify the local and remote uh, attestment and try to establish a trust between the heterogeneous IOTs. And also we try to uh, extend the secure primitive, uh, um, um, properties of the CPU enclave. And this is our um, um, initial thought for the uh, virtual TPM for the cloud and edge devices, which uh, we will use one hardware TPM, but we will have lots of virtual TPM uh, with the with the path on it uh, because the path is really small for the lightweight LT devices. So we can still do the um, the remote or local te uh, attestation easily. So, and the second part um, is about the flash based uh, root of trust system, and uh, uh, we try to leverage two features of flash to solve the security issues. Once we try to use the back page or back blocks initialization table to generate the uh, some uh, random uh, random uh, numbers, and uh, because the because of the limitation of the back pages and blocks, we may use some bit errors to uh, enhance the security features. So this is a part of the key generation. We also have um, the um, root of trust system based on the one-time program error, uh, which can, um, uh, uh, which can um, um, provide some strong features for the secure boot. And uh, for the third part, we have the TE, and uh, because, uh, because of our root of trust the system based on the flash, we're able to initialize the enclave easily. And uh, the good thing is that uh, um, I think most IoT devices may have the some um, um, NVM, for example, T, uh, the, the NAND flash, NOT flash, um, SD card. So um, this would be a very simple and uh, secure solution for the um, for the edge computing um, devices. And the third part is um, a homo homogeneous T interface because we may have different processors. We try to like um, uh, um, uniform the uh, interface between these TEs so that we can um, easily do the communication between the, uh, the enclave and other processor host applications. Um, so this is a big picture for our um, privacy preserving computing in the cloud. Uh, we may have different uh, um, CPUs and for example, SG, uh, the Intel ARM RISC-V and we have some uh, TE groups and we have some computation group. And meanwhile, for the um, 
for the uh, communication between these two groups, we may use the secure multi-party computation. Uh, and uh, uh, inside we inside the T group, uh, we may have the uh, four point month encryption. So uh, as a conclusion, I think we try uh, currently the HTE solution uh, actually suffer from uh, lots of um, limitation, for example, the, the TE uh, resources and uh, some heterogeneous uh, provide, uh, process architecture. And uh, um, because of that, we try to leverage some, some, some very simple and uh, small hardware um, security primitives to accelerate the TE process so that we can achieve some better performance for our, our lightweight IoT devices in certain, sense, in certain scenarios. And I think the third part is, um, um, it's an open question how, how to like um, make the um, privacy preserving and computing efficient, but uh, um, we still need to, um, we still have a long way to go uh, to uh, secure our heterogeneous HIT devices. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Professor Yang. It's a great talk, and uh, you help uh, us a lot and uh, let us to uh, to know some new ideas from the, uh, 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 the security of, uh, about the uh, uh, embedded system, uh, 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 such as uh, some uh, uh, synonymous. So due to the uh, <clears throat> time limited, so let's start uh, the third report directory, okay? Okay. The, the topic, the third topic, is uh, uh, building computing system for autonomous vehicles given by uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Yu. Before he gave us a wonderful uh, talk, let me introduce uh, Yu Bo uh, briefly. Bo Yu received the bachelor's uh, degree in electronic technology and sciences from Tianjin University in uh, 2006, and the PhD degree from the Institute of the Microelectronics, Tsinghua University in 2012. He is currently the CTO of the Percept In, a company focusing on, provide, on providing visual perception solutions for optics and autonomous driving. His current research in interests include algorithms and systems for robotics and uh, autonomous works. works. Dr. Yu is a founding member of the IGP Special Technical Community on Autonomous Driving. He is also a senior member of the IGP. Dr. Yu, are you ready? <coughs> Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, uh, this is not your, uh, sh your show in 30 minutes. Okay, uh, prefer, uh, uh, pr Professor P, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about um, the latency aware a computer system design for uh, autonomous driving vehicles, uh, <clears throat> uh, which mainly comes from our uh, industrial experience um, in, the, uh, in the past few years. Um, so, uh, uh, can you see my screen? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 first, a little background. So, as we know, uh, autonomous vehicles have become uh, popular these days. Um, for example, in China, robot taxi fleets have started to operate uh, on the road and uh, <clears throat> In China, almost every newly made electric car is equipped with uh, some kind of ADAS, uh, Advanced Driving Assistant System. Uh, so um, in these automobile vehicles, uh, they use a high performance computing system to uh, accomplish uh, autonomous driving tasks. Um, so uh, the high performing computing system uh, actually is the brain of these vehicles. Um, design a high uh, performance computing and also reliable computing system um, is actually critical to 
uh, autonomous vehicles, and it's quite a challenge as well. So here is the overview of this talk. In uh, this talk, I will firstly um, talk about design challenges of computing system design for uh, autom autonomous vehicles. Um, I will use a real product to show the workload and the performance uh, characteristics of uh, the vehicle's computing system. We call it onboard computing system. Um, the performance evaluation uh, will also shown in this talk and will demonstrate that the latency variation of the computing system uh, is quite large. And this large latency variation um, is actually harmful to the safety of uh, any kind of autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, then I will take a I will take the localization algorithm software as an example to show the uh, this method we uh, we used we propose to mitigate the latency variation, and uh, and at last I will talk about digital twin based simulation uh, for uh, autonomous driving, uh, which could help to um, evaluate the uh, it, uh, the complex software autonomous driving software in a very efficient way. Uh, Uh, this figure shows the um, compute, uh, computational architecture of a computer uh, of, of autonomous driving system. Um, the autonomous driving vehicle has extremely complicated uh, computing software, uh, including the sensing, uh, which process sensor data perception uh, that detects objects and uh, lo locates the vehicle itself uh, in a map, and the decision module that performs. Uh, pass planning and control tasks, uh, which will which can drive the car on a safe route. Um, design a computing system for uh, autonomous vehicles, satisfying uh, the low latency, low power constraints of the application of the software is, is quite challenging. Uh, so, uh, power consumption, latency, and the functional uh, functional safety are the most important design 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 goals for autonomous driving computing system. Um, optimizing the latency and the power consumption of the computing system um, is actually quite challenging because um, autonomous driving software is quite complex as shown in the figure and is also uh, quite computationally expensive. And for the safety uh, in practice, the functional safety uh, is achieved by using some kind of highly reliable chips um, using redundant component, component component, and using um, uh, some safety oriented development process to guarantee the functional safety. So, um, if you are uh, if you are interested in functional safety of autonomous driving, SO two sixty two six two standard is a good reference to, to start with, and um, uh, it's a large topic. And uh, in this talk, I will only talk about latency. Uh, and the power latency and the power consumption um, actually affects safety and reliability as well. Uh, for example, high power consumption uh, can lead to high heat dissipation, uh, which may cause the computing system uh, in unstable states or even crash. <clears throat> and a long computing latency will uh, lead to long braking distance, um, or cause the vehicle lose control when the vehicle speed is very high. So in both cases, it's not uh, very safe if we uh, the, if the computer system have a long a very long end-to-end -end latency. Uh, here is uh, the the demo of our products. So in this talk, I will use uh, the real autonomous autonomous vehicles to show the system architecture and the performance of the computer system. Um, the product is a low-speed autonomous vehicles, of which maximum uh, driving speed is uh, 20 km per hour, and it uses radar, sonar, and cameras for sensing and perception tasks. Uh, the figure here shows the task graph of the on vehicle computing system. Uh, it, it includes sensing, uh, perception, and planning. And the, the table lists the algorithm uh, we use uh, uh, for perception, localization, and the planning task. For example, we use ELAS for depth estimation and ULO for uh, 
object detection and KCF for checking and VLO for localization and MPC for planning. Uh, based on our evaluation of power and latency on, um, on this workload and on FPGA, CPU, and GPU. <clears throat> and uh, we also consider the task level parallelism uh, shown in the uh, figure. Um, so uh, we propose a system uh, using FPGA, uh, GPU, and uh, Intel CPU to uh, optimize the latency and the power consumption. And FPGA is used for sensor interface logic and the sensor, um, some sensor pre-processing tasks. And GPU is used for uh, DN perception model and the CPU is used for localization, planning and the control tasks. And, and the more details, if you're interested, can be found in uh, the reference paper in the bottom of this page. <clears throat> so he here is the evaluation results on the uh, computing system. Uh, just shown uh, the power of the computing system is around 120 watts and the average end-to-end -end latency is around 160 milliseconds. Um, but uh, a long tail latency distribution exists as shown in the red figure. And we find that the latency variation um, exists in actually in every uh, software component, including the sensor, uh, the sensing, localization, perception, and planning. And uh, we also find that the latency variation uh, is not, uh, it's not only caused by the software systems such as uh, like the operating system middleware, but also by the dynamic environment. Um, uh, for example, for the uh, later case, the latency variation of a localization algorithm is uh, actually uh, cost uh, contributed by the dynamic environment. So uh, the next session, I will talk about the uh, uh, the latency aware localization accelerated design uh, and show how to how we deal with the latency variation uh, in the localization accelerator design. Yeah, here is the um, here is the, the task graph of the localization algorithm. We use the, this algorithm as an example to show the cause of latency variation and also show our methods to optimize latency and, uh, and variation. <clears throat> so uh, in general, auto autonomous vehicles use a so-called SLAM algorithm to, uh, to build a map, a, a feature map, a, a 3D land landmark map, and to locate the vehicle itself in the mark. Uh, in the map, uh, a typical SLAM algorithm um, uh, basically consists of two parts, uh, the front end part and the back end part. Uh, uh, so basically speaking, the front end part associates sensor measurements uh, with a 3D uh, physical landmark from uh, consecutive sensor frames and use this uh, association between uh, between sensor data and the physical landmark, the front end can output initial estimation of the prediction in the uh, prediction of the landmark in the 3D world. And according to these landmarks, 3D and landmarks estimated, and the front end can compute the autonomous vehicles post um, based on this information. Um, the back end part uh, basically use a optimization methods. Uh, to uh, optimization algorithm to uh, to to further refine the accuracy of the map and the vehicle post generated by the front end. So uh, the, the the paper here lists the, this approach in detail. Um, so uh, we provide the the, the architecture the, the the SLAM software. So by profiling the algorithm, we have several findings. So first, as shown in the figure. Um, on the left, compared with the front end, the back end shows much higher uh, latency variation. And the second finding that the latency uh, of the back end actually correlated to the uh, number of checked features in the environment as shown in the right hand side figure. Um, this means that uh, the latency variation of the back end is mainly caused by the dynamic environment. Based on um, these findings, we uh, uh, have two kinds of strategies for <coughs> uh, the localization accelerator design. 
for the front end, since the latency variation <coughs> is small, the design goal is not to, 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 to deal with the latency variation. The design goal is to minimize the latency itself and improve the frame throughput and there's under the area and the power constraints. So uh, here is the front end hardware architecture uh, and the, we use parallelism techniques, we use pipeline techniques and we optimize on-chip memory macro architecture, uh, which could guarantee the front end hardware can, can receive the uh, high frame rate uh, images. Um, the, to guarantee the high frame rate images uh, enable high performance feature tracking of the uh, uh, of the algorithm and it can give better um, localization results. <clears throat> for the back uh, for the back end accelerate design it, it's a different story. Uh, the design goal is actually is to reduce the worst case of the latency. Uh, a straightforward method is to uh, design an accelerator uh, that takes account for the worst case. Uh, but this approach uh, obviously will waste computing resource at runtime because it only considers the worst case. Uh, we would like to design um, a runtime adaptive backend accelerator. So it uh, can deal with the worst case, but it also can adapt to the environment. Uh, adapt to the workload to um, to to save some kind of uh, power uh, to save power or say uh, to save power at runtime. Uh, but there are two challenges to design this kind of runtime accelerator. Um, the first one is that, as shown in the figure uh, in the figure on the left, the first one is that the backend optimization algorithm uh, is quite complicated and is is irregular. Uh, manually exploring the design space to get a optimal solution is quite difficult. So uh, we we need a design tool to help with the design space exploration and the design uh, uh, design optimization. Uh, the second challenge is uh, how to adapt to the uh, dynamic environment at runtime. Since uh, autonomous vehicles typically operate in uh, various kind of <clears throat> environments, uh, include, including outdoor, uh, outdoor and indoor environments, which will affect these environments will affect the workload at runtime, and actually it uh, leads to latency variation. So the challenge is if we can utilize uh, the workload variation um, to 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 optimize company resources at runtime, and uh, this uh, runtime mechanism should also uh, should save power, uh, but not hurting, uh, but not hurts the latency and the accuracy. Uh, here is the framework we proposed to overcome the two, uh, the, the above two challenges. We propose this framework. Uh, the framework, uh, the framework uses uh, macro data flow of graph to model the algorithm, and to we use the macro data flow. Uh, graph as a tool to simplify the design space exploration. Uh, so based on the data flow graph and the domain knowledge of the SLAM algorithm, we design a hardware template. Um, as shown in the figure, um, the, the, the hardware template module have several reconfigurable block, uh, which uh, power of which power and latency can be tuned through these uh, parameters. And by tuning these parameters, um, we can make trade-off between the power and the latency and the area. Um, the, the, the next key block is the uh, uh, automatic hardware generation block. So given the design constraints and the parameters in the, carriage, uh, in the hardware templates, a constraint optimization problem can be formulated by, uh, by the hardware generation uh, module and an optimal design can be obtained by solving the optimization problem. Um, then uh, the hardware generation will give a Verilog RTL, which is uh, optimized the static design. Uh, then we can get FPJ design. For the runtime part, at runtime, the uh, running configuration module uh, uh, can close some hardware block through a call gating technique according to the strategy to reduce power 
according to the workload variation, uh, while not uh, while not affecting the accuracy and the latency. Uh, the figure here shows the hardware template uh, we we proposed, to, which is constructed from the uh, macro data flow graph. Uh, and the formula here shows the optimizing uh, optimization problem we uh, we formulated. Uh, uh, given the design constraints, the the static optimizer will uh, determine a will calculate a optimal static design under the constraints uh, under the constraints given this. Uh, tunable parameter. Um, the red figure actually uh, explains why our runtime optimization uh, can work. Uh, because we find that the iteration number of the optimization algorithm is some kind of uh, correlated to the number of checked features. Uh, the, uh, for the worst case, it needs to uh, iterate maximum times, but for the other cases, the number of iterations, the number of iterations can be reduced, so it gives us opportunity to uh, close some computing units uh, to reduce the iteration times while save power, save energy at runtime. Here is some of the results. The left figure demonstrates the effect effectiveness of the static optimizer. Uh, the results show. Shows, uh, the results show that the automatic synthesis design uh, are optimal designs, and uh, compared with uh, mm, compared with Intel and ARM processor, our accelerated design shows great power efficiency and performance advantages. Um, and based on our evaluation, the runtime uh, mechanism can save extra uh, a ten percent to twenty percent power. Are compared with the static design. Uh, for the last part, it's about a simulation tool for testing and verification autonomous autonomous driving software and hardware. Uh, the reason I, I will talk about a simulation tool here is uh, testing autonomous driving system is ex expensive, generating data to evaluate uh, software like localized software, perception software is quite expensive and time consuming. Uh, it's because keeping a number of um, autonomous vehicles running on the road to get data for software verification system uh, validation is quite expensive. You need to uh, run a number of, uh, run a fleet of vehicles and you need to hire some operators to drive the car. Um, so we use a digital twin based simulator to uh, reduce the testing and the to reduce the testing the testing and the verification uh, cost um, to effectively uh, to effectively test the autonomous driving software in a simulated environment the 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 simulation tool the simulator should be able to uh, reconstruct real traffic scenarios uh, so our digital twin based simulator um, use three fundamental components to to compose uh, real traffic scenarios it use um, the structural twin to rebuild the 3d world uh, use physical twin to uh, simulate high fidelity sensor data and use uh, logical twin to uh, simulate traffic behaviors and interactions um, with these three key components. The digital twin uh, simulator um, can generate sensor streams as shown in the figure to the uh, AD software um, and can receive control commands from the AD software, uh, autonomous driving software to uh, drive the simulated Eagle vehicle to, uh, to move forward. So in the, uh, in the next, uh, three slides. I will briefly introduce uh, the three key components, the structural twin, the logical twin, and the physical twin. Uh, the physical twin. So here is the, logic, uh, the logical twin. Um, the, the logical twin. The direct way to create 3D digital twin map is to use uh, the, pro the process borrowed from uh, 3D graphic industry, uh, which creates 3D computer graphic models um, manually. Uh, 
but this approach actually is not scalable uh, of, uh, because obviously it needs a lot of uh, manual work. Um, we propose, we developed a effective method to uh, generate 3D digital, a large scale di 3D digital twin maps from, uh, from the high definition map, uh, which is used by autonomous vehicles for uh, planning and uh, localization. Uh, the, the approach consists of two stages. The first stage uh, is to construct this 3D road surface model from, from the traffic marking maps from the high, defin uh, high, defin uh, high definition map. Uh, the, the second stage is apply the neural network on the point cloud to detect objects above the road and register the 3D graph model uh, above the road. So, um, so uh, com combining the road surface model um, and the 3D uh, computer graphic model above the road, uh, we can get a 3D digital twin environment uh, from uh, from the HD map uh, to reconstruct real world uh, traffic behavior, um, our digital twin system uh, replaces the data recorded by uh, testing vehicles. Um, actually, it's a common practice in uh, autonomous driving simulation industry. Um, however, uh, simply replaying the recorded traffic data doesn't provide uh, the necessary uh, flexibility uh, in modeling the behavior of uh, traffic participants. Uh, it's because in the case of a software updates, the software behavior uh, will be different from that in when recording the data, uh, which also impacts the behavior, which will also impact the behavior of other traffic objects. Uh, so for example, if the uh, software changes the behavior from lane keeping in some in some situation to lane changing um, after a software update in the planning model. Um, the behavior of the other vehicles behind the, the autonomous vehicles should also be changed. Uh, so uh, to adapt to the autonomous driving software update, we treat each traffic participants as a a simple uh, intelligent agent um, in which we um, we apply suitable uh, kinematic models and the behavior planning algorithm on these traffic uh, participants, then we can get uh, some uh, realistic traffic behaviors uh, even when we update the software. Um, the, the last part of the, the digital twin component is a physical twin. Um, it, it, the, phys, the physical twin is about how to simulate the sensor data. Um, so we use a traditional uh, rendering pipeline and uh, uh, computer graphic models to generate uh, image information such as RGB image, uh, depth image, and the schematic information. Um, to simulate LIDAR, we use a material aware approach to uh, synthesize LIDAR point count based on a ray tracing rendering uh, technique. And different from a depth map or a uh, recasting technique, our method can get uh, intensity information for the LIDAR sensor and can get realistic intensity distribution uh, of LIDAR data compared with real data as shown uh, in the figure below. Uh, so uh, by combining the uh, the aforementioned uh, structural twin, um, uh, the logical twin, and the physical twin, uh, we can have a consistent and a com com and a, a, a compact digital twin simulator. And use this kind of digital twin based simulator. We find that uh, using the uh, simulation approach can reduce the testing cost by uh, at least twenty times. Uh, when compared with uh, physical te uh, physical tests, uh, well, that's the end of my talk. So, uh, in, in summary, uh, in this talk, I I I use a real products 
uh, automobile driving vehicle uh, to illustrate its computing system and uh, the evaluation results. And we find that the uh, latency and the power will also affect the safety of the automobile driving vehicles. And the uh, latency variation exists in nearly uh, every software component in the uh, computing system. And uh, we, uh, we use a localization algorithm as an example to, to show how we deal with the long latency and uh, um, how we deal with the latency variation. And uh, in the last part, I introduced our twin-based simulation approach, which can uh, effectively, uh, effectively reduce testing costs and uh, efficiently uh, generate testing data and verification data for the software and the computing system development for the autonomous driving uh, system. Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Yu. From your talk, we learned a lot about the computing system components for uh, autonomous workers, right? Especially how to design the latency over uh, uh, localization accelerators. So thank you uh, again. It's very uh, wonderful talk. So thank you, thank you. Um, there is another question um, uh, from the zoo, but due to the time limited, we we are not uh, talking to uh, discuss it again. If you are available, uh, could you uh, reply uh, the question? through the WeChat room, okay? No problem. So the, uh, this workshop, um, uh, heterogeneous edge computing for embedded system, HEC, is initiated uh, by me and another elegant lady, Professor Liu Tong from the Shanghai University. She's also one of the vice chairman of the uh, CCF uh, China Computer Federation, uh, Yuxer, Shanghai. Uh, in the next, I will hand the right of coordination over here on the left part of the uh, workshop. Uh, are you ready, Liu Tong? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for introducing me. Um, Professor Pei is a full professor and uh, doctoral supervisor with the Shanghai, the University of Shanghai for Science and Te Technology. He is uh, the, the chairman of CCF Yuxi Shanghai and a senior member of IEEE and a distinguished member of CCF. And the, the uh, left of the uh, workshop will be uh, hosted by, by me. I'm, I'm, Tong Liu from Shanghai University. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Chen Chen. Professor Chen is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. His main research interest lies in computer systems, computer ar architectures, and cloud computing. He has published over 100 peer reviewed papers in leading. Uh, related in leading papers and in, in leading journals and conferences, has the uh, recipients of the NSF Carey Award and IEEE PCSC Award for Excellence. He is awarded the uh, 2018 Alibaba Demo uh, Academic Young Fellow. He is on the editor board, uh, editor board of Tyro. Parallel Computing, GCST, and FCS. Um, Professor Chen. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? You start? Yes, I can hear you and I can see the screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks Songwen and uh, thanks Liu Tong. So uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to introduce our recent work about uh, the microservice scheduling in cloud edge continuum. So uh, in this talk, I will mainly introduce two of our recent work in this area. So first of all, uh, let me introduce some basic background. 
as we know that uh, currently, like uh, the largest scale services, uh, traditionally the, these services are often monolithic. That means all the codes are written into a single software and they are coped together and deployed on the servers together, right? So on each server, we will deploy a single software. And then now it comes become to the microservice architecture. In the microservice software architecture, the entire service is decoupled into uh, a great many of microservices. These microservices can be deployed and uh, scheduled to many different servers. It has enabled the decentralized de deployment and it is much easier for the programmers to write their codes, right? Because like a, a single programmer can only can focus on only a single uh, part or a single stage that do not need to understand the entire application. That is much easier. So these are software trends, software trends. For example, for example, we can find that uh, there are some social networks. This is a social network application. It itself already have like, uh, as we show here, uh, like uh, 36 microservices. And these microservices are created through different programming languages. Programming languages. And another such microservice uh, example is some buzzer network. This kind of application also have 12 microservices and created through six programming languages. So this example shows that this kind of microservice software architecture is becoming more and more like uh, popular, right? And from the hardware trends, we also find some new development development trends. The first possible development trend is the cloud edge continuum. That means the clouds, the very powerful cloud nodes and the like uh, the edge devices become all begin to collaborate with each other to run the same application. Why there are such collaboration? This is mainly because both clouds and edge have their advantages. For example, the edge devices are more close to the end users. So these edge devices have low network latency, have low develop, uh, deployment price, but its computational ability is also lower, right? It do not have sufficient resources to run all the, uh, all the tasks. On the contrary, on the clouds, it has very high uh, computational power, but it is relative uh, far from the end users and have relative high network latency. So in this scenario, if we can combine the two, we can somehow gain the advantage of low latency and the advantage of high performance. And in this area, we can also find that the microservice software architecture matches such cloud edge continuum because the entire application is decoupled to many microservices. We can deploy some microservices on the edge devices and deploy the other uh, microservices that require high computation power on the cloud, right? So that is a good match. That's a good match. Another trend we, uh, we observe in current clouds is that uh, cloud providers start to build data centers in multiple geo geographic regions. They deploy the data centers like uh, for example, some may be deployed in Shanghai, some may be deployed like uh, in Beijing, some may be deployed in like uh, uh, Hohohot, right? So they can build data centers in different regions so that uh, uh, like the users in different regions can access their cloud in short latency. Moreover, moreover this is also because uh, different regions also have different operation 
cost for the data centers, for data centers. So they can build this data center in different region and try to use a central controller to like uh, schedule their tasks across the data centers in different regions, in different regions. So uh, we can say for this kind of geo-distributed clouds, microservices is also a very good software architecture to like uh, fully utilize this computational power, computational power. So from our observation of, from the trend we find, we already say, we can find that the key problem here is how can we efficiently schedule these microservices in cloud edge continuum and in the geo distributed clouds, geo distributed clouds. Now let's see in more detail, what are the detailed problems to do such scheduling or to do such collaborative resource management. We found that the first challenge we have to resolve is the bursty loads, the bursty loads. We know that in such clouds or in such uh, like a large data center, they run, they often run the internet services, right? For example, the e-commerce business. For this kind of internet services, we can find that they often have the bursty loads, the bursty load. That means the loads are different at different time. For example, in the left figure, uh, it shows the like uh, the order generation speed of uh, in common business. Like often in normal days, the orders are only uh, nearly uh, 460 orders per second. But in the W11 shopping festival, the order speed becomes uh, 492,000 orders per second. How can we have a technique to handle such bursty loads, right? That is an important thing. That's an important thing. There are several potential solutions can be due to resolve it. The first one is, well, we have a lot of money. We can buy more servers and uh, deploy more servers in a local data center to uh, support the bursty load, right? But that it will be very expensive, very expensive. Another solution, how about we use the edge nodes to support such bursty loads? Or how can we use like some remote data center to support such bursty loads? But if we want to do this one, to do this solution, we have to design some very like intelligent solution, right? To manage how the microservices should be migrated. How can we deploy these microservices? This is the first uh, uh, technical challenge. The second one is we can also find that, okay, when we try to uh, like uh, to schedule these microservices, that is not very simple. It's not just uh, uh, like impacted by the computational ability or computation power, but the data interactions between such microservices are another very important uh, like uh, aspect that impact the, the, the scheduling. Like the two figures here, we show that the size of data communicates between two uh, microservices, mi microservices in two benchmarks, like right? the social network benchmark, another one is a hotel reservation benchmark. We can find that different benchmarks, uh, uh, like a different microservices have different size of data to be transferred between each other, right? Uh, so for this one, we can also find that if this microservices have large data to be transferred are deployed like a one on the edge nodes, one in the data, one in the cloud, or the two microservices are split to do to two data centers. 
such communication overhead will be quite high, and such uh, network overhead will cause very serious performance degradation and hurt user experience, hurt the QS. So we have to have some solution to resolve these two challenges. So uh, technically, our technique try to resolve two problems. One is how can we minimize the resource usage while ensuring the required low latency, ensuring the QS. The other one is if there are some load burst, how can we still ensure the quality of service when the local data center do not have enough computational power or uh, computational ability? Now let's see the details. This is the first solution. What have we done to minimize the resource usage while ensuring the low latency when we like uh, deploy the microservice across the node, uh, across the clouds and the edge? Okay, now let's first uh, say uh, uh, like uh, an intuitive solution that uh, enables the cloud edge continuum. In this intuitive deployment strategy that is used in the Kubernetes uh, framework. In this framework, we can use a best effort strategy to like uh, allocate the microservice to the cloud nodes and the edge nodes. The left, fig uh, the left figure actually shows uh, like uh, the 99 percent latency of the benchmarks of the benchmarks if we use the Kubernetes to do the microservice scheduling. From here, we can find that in both low loads and the high loads, if we adopt Kubernetes to do the scheduling, the benchmark suffers from QS violation. Even at low loads, it has the QS violation about uh, 2x. And uh, when the load is high, the violation could be more than uh, five times. This is mainly because like uh, for Kubernetes, it cannot or it do not identify which microservice actually determine the latency of the entire service. It do not know which one is the bottleneck, right? So it cannot uh, efficiently allocate the resources. resources. And the right figure actually shows the amount of resources allocated to uh, each macro service stage. We can find that like uh, Kubernetes actually allocates too many resources to some of the microservice, like this one, this media microservice, it allocates too many resources to it, but allocates too fewer resources to the bottleneck microservice. So the best efforts strategy is not working in the uh, like a cloud edge continuum. So uh, we can look at in more detail why, right? So the bottom figure here actually shows uh, like an example where we deploy a service with four microservices, M1, M2, M3, and M4. They are deployed in three nodes, one cloud nodes and two edge nodes. When we try to, when we deploy this microservice in this way, we can find that there are several uh, facts actually impact the end-to-end -end latency. The first one is there are resource competition on the same node, like uh, M1 and M2 will contend for the memory space, will contend for the like uh, the memory bandwidth, etc. This kind of this kind of contention may result in the performance degradation. Like M1 and M2, uh, both M1 and M2 run slower, often run slower than their solo run scenario. The second one is uh, like uh, the communication between different nodes, like uh, 
when we when M2 try to communicate with M3, it will go through the public network. That will cause how communication will head. This is the second uh, challenge. The third one is that is actually related to the load bursting. We know that when the load burst, like uh, if the load increase, M1 may require more resources. M2 may also require more resources. In this case, the single cloud node do not have enough resource to support both M1 and M2, right? In that case, we need to migrate some of, some of the microservices. There's no set optimal policy to do such a scheduling. So we have to have some way to dynamically reschedule these microservices. In microservices. Now let's see our solution. Let's see our solution. Our solution to resolve such uh, scheduling across uh, clouds and edge, what we call uh, Nautilus. What we call Nautilus. This figure actually shows a very general design of Nautilus. Uh, this Nautilus system or Nautilus framework have three main parts. The first part is a microservice mapper. This microservice mapper mainly divides the microservice graph. This is a graph. Divide it uh, into many subgraphs to minimize the communication overheads across the different nodes. This is a microservice mapper. The second one uh, part is a contention aware resource manager. This resource manager actually allocates the resources to each microservice to minimize the resource consumption. But we do not want to, to allocate too much resource to uh, like uh, one microservice and allocate too few resource to another microservice. We need to uh, intelligently adjust the resource allocation. And the third one is the loader where scheduler. This loader will scheduler actually uh, is used to handle the bursty loads. So handle the bursty load. If the load burst, it may quickly identify which node is busy and try to migrate some of the microservices to the other idle nodes. The idle nodes. These are these are three parts of Netflix. Now let's see the detailed uh, part. The detail part for the microservice mapper, its purpose is to divide the entire like uh, microservice graph to multiple subgraphs, right? And the purpose is to like uh, minimize the data communication between the different nodes. So in this case, we can abstract this problem to be a graph cut problem. Try to minimize the cut as minimize the cut. So for this kind of graph cut problem, that is an NP hard problem, right? So if we want to like uh, quickly find such cuts at a real time or on real time, so we determine to use a approximate method based on the Ford folks algorithm. Use this algorithm, we can like uh, uh, if we use this algorithm to cut the graph, we can reduce the communi communication overhead by 2.7x. And uh, uh, this kind of graph cut can complete in 400 milliseconds. So if you're interested, you can look at uh, our paper in multi detail to find the detail algorithm. The other one is the resource manager. This resource manager is trying to like uh, adjust the amount of resources allocated to each microservices, right? So uh, because we want to do such resource allocation at the wrong time, so uh, our solution is based uh, on the like a uh, uh, reinforcement learning to do this resource management. For this uh, re reinforcement learning, 
the key part is to design the reward function. So our reward function is defined in this way. In this way. So uh, the main limitation is we have to guarantee that the uh, to guarantee the short latency, right? So the QS quality of service latency is a uh, hard constraint. If the QS is not uh, insured, there will be a very uh, expensive punishment on this resource reward. So in this way, we can like uh, try our best to minimize the QS violation. And uh, the resource is defined to be uh, defined according to the like uh, the cost model. We try to minimize the cost we use to deploy uh, like uh, such microservices. This is a, a reinforcement learning based resource manager. And for the load will scheduler, in this work, like uh, the problem is, as we said, is some nodes may become bottleneck when they are, are load burst, right? The load increase significantly in a short time. This bottleneck, this node will become the bottleneck. Like uh, uh, in this figure, we have three nodes, cloud nodes N1 and two edge nodes N1 and N2. And when a load burst, we may find that, okay, currently, node N1 do not have enough resources, right? It will try to migrate some microservice out. When we determine which microservice to be migrated out, we try to first uh, migrate the microservice with small data first. Uh, we do such decisions because we want to like uh, reduce the resource allocation. Oh, we reduce the communication overhead, right? For example, here we try to migrate M2 first, M2 first. But we found that, okay, the three nodes, N2, do not have enough resources for the M2 microservices. So it may refuse the migration. Then it will go to uh, to the microservice with a little bit larger data to be transferred. Then we can go to the M3 microservices and we find that, okay, currently, as you note, everyone have enough resources for it. So in that case, we migrate M3. So this is a heuristic method to do the like uh, microservice migration. migration. So now let's see uh, some experimental results. For this experiment, uh, we actually test this Nutless framework on a scenario with one cloud node and two edge nodes. And you test a bench and the train ticket as a benchmark to do the test. Uh, the final result is actually Nutless is able to guarantee the QS, the required uh, uh, short latency for all the benchmarks in all the cases. And compare with like uh, uh, the prior work, uh, the rhythm, it can save about 24% computational resources and 53% uh, network bandwidth usage. Bandwidth usage. Okay, so that's the work we have done, done to uh, do the scheduling across cross node, uh, the cloud nodes and the edge nodes. Now we can say another work, like uh, if the load bursts significantly, how what can we do to ensure the QS? So in this work, the problem is if the load burst, if the load burst, the local data center or the local cloud do not have enough resources to support the load, we may need to use uh, resources in remote data center to support the excessive loads, right? So uh, over here, what we have to consider are two things. The first thing is 
how can we allocate just enough resource to install uh, to each microservice so that the local data center can support the highest throughput. In that case, we do not need to rely on remote data center at all, right? The second one is, okay, when we have to rely on the remote data center, we need to consider uh, which one we need to uh, migrate to the remote one, right? In that case, we need to consider the communication cost across the data centers and the performance gain when we migrate uh, like uh, some microservice to the remote one. And the third constraint, when we to determine the scheduling, we need to try to minimize the resource, the remote data center usage, right? We still want to try our best to use the local data centers. So uh, to resolve that problem, to resolve that problem, uh, the solution we propose is called Alice. Called Alice. This, is, this work is also published at uh, RTDPS 2012 uh, 22. In this Alice framework, it also has two uh, key components. The first one is a resource manager. This resource manager uh, function is to do the resource allocation for each microservice. And uh, another one is a reward based microservice migrator. It try it resolves the problems of migrate microservice at bursty load. At bursty load. And the right part of this figure shows a geo distributed data center. Data center. Now let's see. Uh, how the resource manager and the microservice migrator actually works. For the resource manager, for the resource manager, this resource manager in turn also has two parts. Also have two parts. Like uh, in this figure, the left part of the resource manager is uh, like a is a uh, analyzer. It's an analyzer. This analyzer actually analyze the order to adjust re the resource allocation for the microservices. The right part is a resource manager that actually performs the uh, adjustment operation. When we determine to uh, like uh, determine the order to perform the adjustment. We have uh, some guidelines, some guidelines. The first guideline is when we try to adjust the resource allocated to the microservice, we need to try to first adjust the microservices on the non-critical path because they are on the non-critical path, even if their performance is hurt slightly, it will not impact the, like, uh, the entire end-to-end -end latency, right? So we will try first to release resource from this uh, microservice on the non-critical path and uh, compensate it to the microservice on the critical path. The second one is we try to adjust the microservices with better performance to release resources and uh, like uh, relax allocate the resources to the poor performance ones. This is also easy to understand, right? Because the microservice have better performance. Uh, we release the resources to it. It will have like a lower uh, or smaller chance to like uh, hurt the QS. This is a uh, order to do the uh, like a resource adjustment. About the actual resource allocation, what we done is use a base optimization to perform such an adjustment. Uh, such an adjustment, because this kind of adjustment, we also want to 
uh, like uh, to do it online or to do it at real time, at the wrong time, right? So the base optimization is a good uh, AI method to perform such adjustments. Maybe like we can find that uh, base optimization is a solution and uh, the with reinforcement learning we introduced before is also another possible solution in this step, in this step. And now uh, let's see the final like a reward based the solution. When we try to migrate the like uh, microservice at a burst load, we also have two guidelines. The first guideline is when we try to migrate microservices, we try to migrate the one with higher potential performance gain. That means we can migrate only a small number of microservices, then we can gain a lot of performance or we can greatly reduce the end-to-end -end latency, right? We need to try to first migrate this one. And another one is we need to try to migrate microservices with small network communication cost to reduce the cross data center communication cost. So based on these two guidelines, we can design such a uh, reward-based solution. Uh, I will not introduce them here in detail. You can go through our papers. And now let's see uh, what happens when the load bursts and when the load drops. Actually, when the load bursts, we actually migrate some microservice to the remote data center to ensure the QS. And when the load drops, we have to migrate, migrate back some back microservice to better utilize the local data center. When we migrate the microservice back, we use a reverse order to migrate the microservice out of the local one. For this one, we also uh, do it uh, with a real uh, experiment setup. We use one local data center and the two remote data centers, and we use the like uh, test bench and the firm as a software and uh, the baseline. Actually, we can find that uh, when the load burst, uh, the Alice, the solution we propose here, and the Netflix we introduced before, both of them can enable the like uh, QS. But uh, compared with Netflix, Alice can reduce more resource usage. Resource usage. So uh, the last one is the conclusion. Actually, we introduced several techniques to reduce the communication overhead, that is to like uh, to cut the graph into subgraphs. We can use the like uh, composite based uh, resource manager to reduce the performance interference. We can use reinforcement learning and the base optimization method to reduce uh, tail latency to manage the resources. And we can use the reward based uh, migrator to improve the service throughput. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all my talk. If you are interested, you can go through the papers or send me an email to discuss the details. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Chen, for your sh for sharing your impressive works on the, uh, the mac macro service scheduling in cloud and edge community. community. Uh, thank you for your sharing. And thank you. Now, uh, let let me uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Guangyin Zhang. Professor Zhang received uh, uh, his bachelor degree in applied uh, mathematics uh, from Shan Shandong Normal University in two thousand and three, and his bachelor uh, master degree in op uh, operational research and cybernetics from Shanghai University in two thousand and six and his PhD degree in information and communication engineering from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2012. From 2013 to 2014, he was a post uh, doctor research associate with the Institute of Network Coding at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is currently a professor and the 
a vice dean with the College of Information Science and Technology at Donghua University. His research interests include online algorithms, a capacity scattering of wireless networks, vehicular networks, smart Microsoft microgrids, and mobile edge computing. He has been the local arrangement uh, co-chair of SM tooling uh, 2017 and 2019 and the Vice Technical Program uh, Committee's co-chair of SM Tooling 2018 and 2021. He is an editor on the editor board of IEEE China Communications. Professor Zhang, uh, are you ready for presentation? Yes, you can see my slides and my voice. Look. Yes. Okay. Okay, thanks for the introduction from Tong and uh, thanks for the invitation from the general chairs, uh, Professor uh, Song Wenpei from the University of, of Shanghai for Science and Technology and also Professor Liu Tong from Shanghai University. Okay, uh, for this talk, uh, this is a, a joint work from my uh, PhD student, uh, Zhi Rongsheng. The title of my talk is uh, Competitive online state or switch algorithms with minimum commitment and switching cost, which is a theoretical work uh, for the online algorithm design. Okay, first I will give some, some motivations about the online decision making problems. Uh, as we know, for some emerging AIoT services, and uh, the future is highly violated and unpredictable. Uh, uh, scenarios, the worst case performance should be guaranteed for safety and stability concerns. For example, for autonomous driving for the uh, edge scheduling in a uh, smart microgrid, and uh, also some uh, online decision making problems uh, for some real world scenarios. So the main challenge is that uh, to guarantee the optimality in the present and the future uh, without uh, full knowledge of the future. So uh, there are a wide of a uh, uh, range of uh, application scenarios for this online uh, algorithm design problems. So for an online algorithms, uh, that uh, is a uh, category from the competitive, competitive analysis, which is first uh, produced by the uh, Professor Robert from Princeton University, which is uh, a SM Turing award. So uh, the definition is that for online algorithms, ALG is a C competitive. If for all sequences S, uh, the algorithms S is smaller or uh, equal to C times OPTS plus a, a constant where the ALGS is the cost of the algorithm on the sequence S, and OPTS is the optimal offline cost for the same uh, input sequence, and B is a constant. So uh, if we, uh, we know for the OPTS is the op offline optimal algorithm uh, performance, and the ALGS is the online algorithm performance. So the, uh, uh, the C is a competitive uh, ratio. Uh, for example, if C is near to one, then this online algorithm's performance is near to the off optimal offline algorithms. So competitive ratio is a worst case uh, bound, uh, worst case upper bound. And the competitive analysis is first introduced by Slater and uh, Tarrant in uh, 1985, uh, just uh, mentioned. So for a classic online decision problem is the screen rental problem, which is a very small, very uh, simple uh, scenario, uh, which is defined as this, uh, uh, we can see this figure. Uh, if a uh, 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 traveler want to sky in, uh, sky in uh, uh, he, he or she have two, uh, has two choice. First is rent a uh, sky. A screen, and then uh, he or she can also buy a screen. So at time slot t, 
a decision maker who want to screen has the a choice of either renting screens for one dollar one time, or buyer screens for thirty dollars without knowing when he would stop screen. Here, dirt is larger than one. So, for example, uh, when you you screen, you 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 perhaps first rent one time slot, second time slot. Then until you scan scan third time slots, you, you, you find perhaps it is good for you to buy one. So for this online algorithm, you do not know uh, what time slot you will uh, check for this scan scan. So uh, each pair of scan costs their dollars and is valid forever. And if you want to rent, the cost is one dollar, and there's no discount cost, and the input for online decision is you rent or buy. And we can uh, calculate the uh, minimum competitive ratio for this online uh, screen rental problem, which is a very classic uh, problem is uh, two, which means you will rent, rent, rent until the third time slot you will buy. This is the optimal uh, decision you should make. And, uh, Generalization of this screen rental problem is the bank card problem. Uh, uh, what is a bank card? Bank card is a German, Germany railway discount plan. Uh, for, for example, a traveler want to uh, travel at Germany and want to uh, 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 take the uh, railway. So at time slot T, a traveler want to buy a ticket, decides whether to buy a bank card without knowing the future travel plans or not. The bank card means a, a, a discount plan. For example, if you want to uh, take a railway, you will buy a, a, a ticket. If you do not have a bank card, you will buy the ticket as uh, the ticket price is XT. And if, if you have a, a discount plan, the discount price should be bid times XT. Here, bid is less than one. Uh, for the bank card is uh, so uh, each bank card costs thirty dollars and is valid for time slot. When you buy a bank card, you can uh, then buy the ticket. Uh, use the discount price bit XT uh, into your time slot, and after time slot, you will the the bank card uh, discount plan will be automatically expired. Uh, this is a uh, uh, generalization of the screen rental problem. This is a bank card problem because they have a uh, discount. So uh, we can also uh, calculate the minimum uh, competitive ratio for the online uh, decision maker is two minus beta. So we uh, extend the uh, bank card problem to a, a more uh, generalized uh, version is uh, the stay or switch problem. We also uh, to investigate a, a scenario like the bank problem, but uh, more generalized. For example, we also uh, uh, invest, study the bank problem, but we will buy a bank card and ensure the time slot. We, can, we, we assume that we can also extend this uh, discount plan. When we extend this discount plan, we should pay another uh, commitment cost, uh, means uh, S. So if we buy the bank card, the price is bid times XT plus S plus that. That is the uh, uh, initial uh, upfront uh, cost of the bank card. And S is uh, uh, when you want to extend the time slot. So it's when you stay on that the cost is beta XT plus S. And we, you can also uh, cancel the uh, discount plan at uh, some time, time slot. This time slot will be larger than time slot T. Uh, then the, the uh, price you should pay is XT, yeah. So upon expiration, the decision maker decides whether to extend the discount pile here, where to extend the discount plan and when to cancel it. 
So each uh, discount plan cost dirt plus S per time slot. Yeah, when you extend for one time slot, you will pay S dollars. It's valid for at, at least two times large and want to decide to stay or switch to stay or switch to minimize the cost. So for the considered uh, scenario, there are a lot of uh, real world scenarios. For example, for the uh, micro base station uh, sleep awake problem in the 5G non-standalone access networks. For example, this is a uh, uh, 5G uh, hybrid with the 4G uh, system. There is some traffic loads and the input is traffic loads. The output is a, a micro base station sleep awake decision because when the traffic is low, the, the, the uh, decision maker want to uh, switch the 5G to 4G uh, networks. So there is an adaptive power consumption bit times XT for the 5G and uh, for the 4G and the penalty power consumption from 5G to 4G handoff is XT. And also we have the basic, sorry, basic power uh, S and the wake up power dirt uh, and the minimum runtime T, which is uh, just uh, uh, formulated as a uh, uh, Stay or switch problem of the bank card. And also, the second scenario is a local generators on off problem in the microgrid. Uh, as we know, for the microgrid, it is uh, the, the energy is used locally and uh, generated local, locally. So, we use the local generator to uh, supply for the microgrid uh, uh, electricity load. So the input is the electricity price times the load, which is the cost. And the output is the generator's online or on or off decision. XT is cost caused by buying all energy from the electricity market, from, uh, for example, the state uh, grid. And big, big time XT uh, is caused by running local generators, which is smaller than XT. And S is no load cost, Dirt is a startup cost for the local generators, and T is a minimum of time. And also, the third real, way, real world scenario is a service subscribing or canceling program in the uh, daily life, for example, for the daily expenses, example, the media and the, uh, some uh, message delivery uh, plan. So, the output is uh, you want to subscribing or canceling the uh, decisions. Also, we can formulate the regular price is XT and the discount price is bit times XT or free when you uh, when bit equals zero. For example, for some uh, uh, media in the internet, uh, the pipes will be uh, free. And S is a subscription fee, dirt is an upfront fee. T is the initial subscription period. And also the fourth scenario we uh, give the example is a fixed or variable rich energy plan selection problem. For an uh, industry, if we want to buy some energy from the electricity uh, grid, the input is, is the electricity usage and the output is the fixed or variable rich plan selection. If you want to give a uh, fixed rid plan, uh, perhaps the, whole, the cost is smaller than the variable rid plan for the industry and and the usage and uh, s is the cost of uh, commitment usage that is a canceling fee and also we have a two times slot okay uh, for this uh, theoretical problem uh, we want to uh, give the uh, proof the um, uh, compatible ratio the up bound and the lower bound uh, for this generalized uh, bank card problem which is d or switch bank card problem and uh, the there are several scenarios that can be used for our uh, real world life. And for the prior bank card problem only, there's no worst case performance guarantee with minimum commitment constant. And our competitive analysis, we give a closed form uh, competitive ratio of uh, deterministic online state of switch algorithm uh, for denoted as, as DSS and we give the upper bound. 
here the, the formula means the uh, cost of the uh, deterministic online steel switch algorithm. This is, this is the offline optimal algorithm for all the uh, input. This uh, uh, should be larger than one. We want to, yeah, we want to give the, the uh, upper bound of the C, CR DSS. Uh, CR improves by, by also a randomized version. So the problem uh, we formulated as the cost of a uh, whole world temperate here, C of yt, if yt equals uh, equal zero, then uh, the regular cost is xt. And we want, if we buy a discount, uh, that is switch on, uh, the cost will be uh, bit times xt plus uh, commitment cost and also the up uh, front uh, cost. Uh, when you uh, switch the the state uh, the the details of the system, and yt uh, for is uh, selected from zero or one. So the challenge of the uh, problem is that the commitment period make decisions across time slots and coupled. A uh, state of switch decision depends on future inputs, and the future regular cost is unpredictable. So for this problem formulation, we have formulated the minimum cost achieved by optimal offline algorithms and the cost achieved by online algorithm. And also we give the uh, compact ratio of the minimum ratio over all input. The challenges along is the online algorithm with small compact ratio are desired and the worst case with maximum ratio is difficult to analyze. And our idea is first we generate random input sequences and find the op optimal offline solutions and summarize the useful observations from the offline uh, algorithm and follow the offline optimal and uh, design an online fashion, uh, characterize the competitive ratio uh, and also at, at the end extend to the randomized online algorithm. So focus on the uh, community cost difference. Here, dirt UV is uh, captures the cumulative cost difference in time period. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, X is uh, uh, the cost per time slot, and UV is time slot. So we define dirty is the difference of the cumulative cost uh, from the uh, regular cost and the uh, discount cost. When dirt uh, larger than zero, indicates the discount cost is lower and vice versa. So we can find from this, this figure, if, if we do not have a discount plan, this is a, the cumulative uh, cost, and we, we, we have a discount plan. We have this line, and the, the join point is here. Yeah. So when dirt is less than zero, perhaps this is good. And when dirt is larger than zero, we should, we should have a discount plan. And we find the optimal offline solutions. Uh, for example, we let S equals two. This is the commitment cost. And this is the uh, uh, first up front uh, cost. The time slot, the uh, 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 plan, the discount plan efficient, uh, coefficient, and the XT is the cost. So here we calculate dirty is the difference. We find that for, for this, this is offline. This is on, this is off. This is on, this is off. We calculate that for dirt one five times dot one five. This is minus one four four minus one. Yeah, here is six larger than than three. And also the, we can also calculate this on status. That uh, is uh, four two four and minus one minus one. This, this is seventeen so less larger than three. We we find that uh, the ti to ti hat is larger than zero. So this two status is uh, the on status. Also, we can find the off. Yeah, just like the on. Uh, we can find this minus two, minus two, minus two. This is minus six. Also, we find the community difference in off, optimal off period is less than the negative switching cost. And also, some uh, uh, the switching point from uh, time slot seven to time slot eight, this is the switching cost. And also, this is a switching uh, point. We can also find the dirt is uh, the sign of that dirt is uh, different. 
and some special cases we also give some uh, 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 example analysis. So we find there are some uh, intuition from the offline uh, algorithms, and we want to design the online. Online is the red line. And if it's the time slot, uh, I will just uh, slip this uh, slice. And uh, we, 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 we use three steps to find the, uh, to design the online algorithms, which is follows, just follows the uh, behavior of the on offline algorithms. Yes, this is all offline. For online, you should first uh, learn and find some uh, behavior and perhaps uh, less uh, uh, follow the, the offline. So our online algorithms, if we first find all time slots with uh, the offline optimal algorithm misswitch and check the switching on condition and check the switching off condition, uh, this is a pursuit of the uh, code of our uh, algorithms. And the offline of optimal offline algorithms versus the competitive online algorithms, we find that a lemma is a deterministic switch or a steel switch algorithm always switch on yeah, of uh, optimal on period. And we uh, prove that the deterministic steel or switch algorithm has a bounded compared ratio that is uh, smaller than uh, four. It is trivial that is uh, larger than one. And also, the DSS algorithm had a bounded compared ratio. Uh, we we, we uh, just uh, calculate and uh, prove the the bound. Yeah. So uh, the DSS uh, switches on off twice in one optimal on off period. Uh, we, we use some uh, uh, formulas and uh, uh, analyze the the uh, parameters and find that uh, to maximize the compared ratio. Yeah, and find the boundaries of each uh, differences. At least we find that the GSS has a bounded, sorry, has a bounded uh, compared ratio. We form this the co cost ratio and find the boundary of each uh, dirt and maximize the cost ratio. And at least we prove this uh, theorem. So this is a, a deterministic state of switch algorithms. Now we extend it to the randomized uh, algorithm to improve the, sorry, to improve the uh, compare ratio. If the switch on condition of DSS is satisfied, then the, uh, we, we generalize the uh, uh, DSS to the random randomized switch, the uh, steel switch with, with the switch on probability rule, so we switch off probability one minus rule, and we also give the uh, compare ratio of these randomized uh, algorithms. And uh, also we extend this to the two uh, uh, case, for the, for the worst case and the average case. For, for, uh, for the uh, DSS and RSS, we use the uh, uh, worst case. And also we want to, uh, for example, for the real world, there are some uh, optimi optimistic online algorithms and we give the compared ratio. And also we, uh, uh, Calculate the, the, the DSS, ISS, and the optimistic SS has bounded uh, compared ratio. Also, we extend this to the adaptive online algorithms. Because for the DSS, we just use this uh, cost differences, cumulative cost differences. And we redefine this as a function, uh, FT and GT. FT and uh, GT represents the regular and the discount cost function of XT, not just a linear. So for this uh, ADSS, we also give uh, the compare ratio and the uh, uh, theorem. At last, we simulate the 5G uh, in, uh, in the networks. We find that for the deterministic state of which algorithm leads to 32.1% uh, power saving, and the Q-learning with trend uh, model leads to 42.6% per power saving. And also, uh, this is time saving for the switching cost of the uh, uh, ADSS and uh, uh, the, ex the state of the art algorithms. Also, there are some related uh, works for the compared to online algorithm for microgrids, such as uh, uh, Professor Adams group from Caltech and Professor Minghua Chen's uh, 
group from uh, CUHK, and also from Purdue uh, University, Professor Xiao Jun Lin and uh, 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 Minghua and uh, Adam also they have some collaborative uh, work. Uh, uh, also, uh, some uh, uh, AI uh, uh, work. Uh, also, they study the compatible analysis for uh, second retail problem and also some uh, classic uh, online uh, decision algorithms. So, as a conclusion, we propose uh, uh, deterministic state of switch algorithms, a compatible online algorithm for state of switch problem, and achieves close from compared ratio upbounded by four, and also does not rely on future knowledge. And uh, as the performance improves by randomized online algorithms, as also we uh, invest, investigate two uh, variants tailored for average case and time varying case. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank Professor Zhang for sharing his impressive works on competitive online state of switch algorithm design. Thank you again. So uh, next, the, the final speaker of our workshop is uh, Wan Shaohua. Profession, Professor Wan received the, uh, uh, let, let me introduce Professor Wan firstly. Professor Wan received his PhD degree from the School of Computer at Wuhan University in 2010. He is currently a full professor with Shenzhen Institute for Advanced Study at University of Electronic Science and Technology of China. Uh, from 2016 to 2017, he was a visiting professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Technical University of uh, Munich uh, in German, Germany. His main research interests include deep learning for Internet of Things. He is an author of over 200 research per papers and books, including uh, over 50 SM or HEE transaction papers and many top conference papers. He's an associate editor in Journal of System Architecture and the HEE Transactions on Intelligent Transport, Transportation System. Over 6,500 citations have been recorded to his publications, and his age index is 20, 42, according to Google Scholar. Uh, he, he is also an a senior member of SM and IEEE. Professor Wan, uh, are you ready for, for your speaking? Yes. Hello? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, okay. Can... <clears throat> uh, thanks for Professor Liu introduction. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Shao Wan. I'm from the University of Electronics Science and Technology of China. Uh, I'm honored to be here to, uh, to give my talk and share with my research, my recent research. Uh, in this talk, I'll give a brief, brief overview of my research on out of distribution, detection, model compression, and explainable artificial intelligence. Okay, deep neural networks are known to make mistakes unpredictably, which causes a significant uh, concerns on their application in safety crit critical systems. One common cause for such mistakes is out of distribution samples, input samples that fall outside of the data distribution of its training data set are well trained DNN, deep neural networks that is highly accurate for in distribution samples, often gives incorrect yet overconfident predictions for out of distribution samples. For example, a deep neural networks binary classifier trained on a data set of images of cats and dogs, binary cats and dogs were misclassified an image of a horse as either cat or dog. Since it is simply does not know about horses, okay? The, the direct reason is 
it is it didn't it doesn't know about horses. Okay. Ideally, the plural networks should fill loudly for such out of distribution images and ask for human intervention. Model compression is used to reduce memory size and execution time of a of a DNN to feed on mobile devices such smartphones, which may be relevant for mobile health applications. Explainable artificial intelligence aims to explain why a machine learning algorithm arrived at a specific decision, which is especially pertinent to medical imaging. I will introduce these topics in a mass-free and accessible manner. As an outside of the medical imaging field, I would like to explore this potential applications to medical imaging. Okay, uh, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, has recently been highly successful in machine learning across a variety of application domains, including computer vision, natural language processing, and big data analytics, among others. For example, deep learning methods have consistently outperformed traditional methods for object recognition and detection in the ISRVRC computer vision competition since 2012. Um, for computer vision applications, the most popular type of deep neural networks is convolutional neural network. A convolutional neural network also covers that compilation of convolution pooling and rectification stages and non-linear activation functions. Hidden layers abstract prediction, abstract increasing abstract features layer by layer, used by the output layer to produce prediction. The hidden, the hidden layers close to the output layer contain high level and semantically meaningful features extracted by preceding convolutional layers. Okay, uh, hey, this is the, my outline of the, of the presentation. Uh, first, the auto distribution detection. Uh, uncertainty arises when a machine learning model say and input the difference from its training data and thus shouldn't be predicted by the model. Determining where the inputs are out of distribution is an essential problem for deploying machine learning in safety critical operations such as autonomous driven or uh, smart health. Okay, uh, mode compression. Such methods usually seek to compress the existing deep neural networks models with minimal accuracy loss, loss, loss compared with the original model. There are several popular model compression methods, such as uh, pruning collection of uh, pruning neurons. Okay, explain or uh, loading distillation. Okay, uh, explainable artificial intelligence or interpretable artificial intelligence or explainable, explainable machine learning is artificial intelligence in which humans can understand the decisions or predictions made by the artificial intelligence. It contrasts the way the black box, black box concept in machine learning, where even it is the designers can't explain why an AI arrived at a specific decision. Or uh, verification of the ANs, uh, while DNNs can achieve excellent, excellent performance in the average case. They are, they are not very reliable or verifiable and may make unpredictable mistakes. Uh, verification and validation tentacles for DNNs can be classified into design, design formal verification, testing, uncertain estimation, and the last out of distribution detection. Okay, all the out of distribution samples, important, important samples that are for outside of the data distribution of the training data set. Current DNS can give incorrect yet overconfident predictions for 
out of distribution samples. Current deep learning classifiers, uh, for example, uh, unfamiliar image outside of the distribution of this training data set, uh, the autonomous driven is trained only in sunny weather, but, the, but then it encounters heavy rain or slow or heavy rainfall or heavy heaven slow in the, in the field. Okay, the, the, the lovely picture, Tesla vehicles have never or really seen trunks overturned on this side. So the trunk is, so the trunk is misclassified, misclassified as the white sky. Okay, the, 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 right, the, right, picture, the right picture, uh, many 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 shares graphically applied to a stop sign. A stop sign caused a misclassification into speed limit sign. Uh, that, that's um, the more the misclassified as a uh, stop sign as speed limit sign. Okay. Out of distribution, maybe due to nature distribution shifts. If an autonomous, autonomous driven is trained only in clear sunny weather. Then adverse weather conditions of a heavy fall, rain, a slow, were look unfamiliar. Okay. Hence, will be out of distribution for the problem surfacing system, or it may be due to adversarial attacks. Minor perturbations, such as stickers added to a stop sign to mimic vandalism, may trick the autonomous driven perception system into misclassifying it into a speed limit sign. The train data set for Tesla. Uh, model have a low or very few images of trucks overturned on this side. So that's the, the direct reason. Okay. Uh, out of, of distri distribution from a machine learning perspective, out of distribution sam samples are anomalies, out of linears, out of distribution detection is a type of anomaly detection. The left uh, picture closely said as a uh, sample scene. All classes known during training figure on the left shows the training data set consists of all in distribution samples with three classes cat, dog, or horse. Or horse. Figure on the right shows some alternates, anomalies, maybe image of a cat with, with a pointy ears like a dog, or image of a dog with a long horse, or Mm, lots of horse face or image of uh, uh, elephants. Okay, so uh, so this out of district out of distribution samples. Okay, uh, use the practice the maximum soft soft max score to separate the outer distribution input with low probability from in distribution in distribution input with high probability. So cat uh, almost uh, uh, zero point. Uh, Line, line probability. Okay, a uh, dog means uh, rep represents one zero the uh, one or zero point one probability. Okay, a uh, comparison of output cl classifier scores it includes new additional overhead beyond the forward inference time, but it has no accuracy and is it and is typically used as the comparison baseline for other Methods. The our work on out of distribution detection. The hidden layers close to the output layer contain high level and semantically meaningful features extracted by preceding convolutional layers. Okay. Um. Uh, if uh, input is out of, out of distribution, then neural activity in the hidden layer should form from a uh, alumni. So uh, isolation forest or uh, local outlier ROF, ROF, both IF and ROF are super unsupervised learning algorithms that only require uh, uh, in distributed data, a lot of auto distributed data during training, which is an advantage of over supervised or unsupervised algorithms. Since auto distributed, distributed data are typically not available or difficult to Obtain. Okay. If I am, if I am, um, if I input in, is in distribution, 
Then activity in the monitor hidden layers should, should be similar to other in distribution data seen during training and vice versa. Okay. Uh, this images medical Im Im imagine. Uh, uh, medical imagine is, is the safety, safety critical application. These, these, these high accuracy and uh, explainability, explainability art, artificial intelligence. For example, these days, pathology may be in teeny patches at a specific lo locations of the image. So uh, uh, art, uh, explainable artificial intelligence may be used to highlight the, local, the localization or the teeny uh, uh, location, okay. Um, so out of, out of distribution in medical imaging may be due to later distribution shifts. Uh, the first the inputs that are, that are unrelated to the task. This, include, this includes observation wrong image from a different domain. For example, MRI image, images processed using a model trained on X-ray, X-ray images, and less observationally wrong images. Uh, for example, raised X-ray, X-ray image processed, processed uh, using a model trained with chest X-rays. The second, inputs that are incorrectly prepared. Uh, inputs with incorrectly prepared, for example, in the case of a, in the case of a chest X-ray images, blurry images, poor contrast, in incorrect view of the anatomy, uh, images with the incorrect file format or, or pre-processing -process, pre applied or changes in data acquisition protocol. The third, disease conditions and artifacts that are unseen in the training distribution due to selection bias. Okay, uh, inputs that are unseen, Sitting bias in training data, image with an unseen decisions, uh, especially in image with an unseen, never seen, never seen uh, uh, disease image, image, which may yield, yield an expected results. So results that are expected results. Okay. Uh, deep learning in medical imaging has the same out of distribution problem. Maybe our research results can be also applied to uh, medical imaging. Uh, the difference autonomous driven is hard real time, hence trade off between algorithm, efficiency, and uh, accuracy. Medical imaging is not real time, so algorithm efficiency is less important than accuracy. Okay, so the, the, so the medical imaging, the, the, um, the efficiency, efficiency, and uh, uh, more, explain, more explainable is important. Okay. A lot of out of distribution examples in medical imaging, training data set of tissue scans contains image from hospital one, two, three. Um, test the data set contains images from hospital five, which may be out of distribution due to, due to different hues caused by different image, image equipment. Uh, especially the, 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 the data format. Okay. Uh, the second model, model expression. Okay. Uh, large DNA models are computation and memory intensive. Model, compre model compre comprehensive reduce memory size and execu execution time or by DN to feed on mobile devices due to cost and power consumption issues. Okay. So multi cooperation uh, is, is, is suitable for smart uh, edge devices or Im embedded, uh, embedded devices, under devices, mobile devices. Okay. Oh. Uh, so pro protein, protein collection or proteins neurons can be considered individually as well as jointly specific for ads, ads and embedded the same system and mobile devices, a proline method is present for commonly used, used deep learning structures in IoT devices and the proline deep neural networks can be immediately deployed on edge devices without 
modification. So uh, we can use the smartphone or application program to perform diagno di medical diagnosis or AI can pick out suspicious images for the human daughters to examine in the future. Okay, the so last uh, one, explain explainable artificial intelligence. Um, highly highly interpret interpretable algorithms are often inaccurate, inaccurate, very accurate DNAs are black box that, that are not directly in interpretable. A common notion in the, in the machine learning community, community is that a trade-off exists between accuracy and uh, inter interpretability. So uh, uh, many, uh, many community machine learning algorithm is a trade-off, is a trade-off between accuracy and uh, interpretability. This means the learning methods that are more accurate or offer less interpretability. Uh, And vice versa. So we, we can we can in this in this slides we can highly accurate models, highly accurate models such as uh, neural networks, neural networks, non-linear relationship, non-smooth relationship, or long compute computation time. Highly interpretable models uh, has char character characters, linear and smooth re relationship easily computed, is easy, easy to compute, such as decision trees. Linear regression classification rules. Okay. Uh, 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 personally, when machine learning, when machine learning uh, models are used in high high stakes decisions, interpretability should be given a high preference over loss of few points of accuracy. It is not only important to say if a model works, but we as machine learning practitioners should also care, care about how it works and the world works without any intention bias. Okay. So we, how to works and the world it works without in, in intentional bias. Okay, classification, classification worth or husk case. Uh, on a collection of additional system images, the classifier practice worth if there is a slow and husky otherwise, regardless of animal color, position, pose, we train it just, we train it just a better classifier intentionally to evaluate where the subjects are able to de detect it. Uh, the only one mistake, only one mistake, there are the others are examples are classified correctly. So uh, explanation for the misclassified image. For the image of a husky is classified as a wolf, the slow in the background has the highest relevance. The direct reason is, the, is that the slow, the slow is in the background has the highest relevance, indicating the classifier is taking a shortcut of using the background to make the prediction. Instead of features of the animal, the classifier, uh, the classifier is actually a slow detector. So, uh, so this is the, the reason. Okay. Another example, correct, uh, correct also correct the classification, but the wrong reason. Uh, classified as a as a boat because it sits on uh, it sits on water. Uh, the, the the below picture classified as a horse due to copyright watermark at a low left uh, color. So we also trained it. We also train this this better, better classifier intentionally. So we then ask the subject three questions. Those so trust that this algorithm, these models, to work well in the real world. The first one, the first question. The second question, why? This the third. How do they think the the, the model the, the method? Uh, is able to distinguish between the, the photos of a wolf and a horse case or a boat or a horse. So uh, we can ask, so in the, uh, in the ground, the, the boat, is not a boat? Okay. Uh, XF for medical imaging, when you use machine learning for medical diagnosis, 
For example, predictions can be acted upon on blind faith as the consequences may be catastrophic. Disease pathology may be in tiny patches as a specific location of the image. Medical imagine this attribution, localization of lesion disease tissues in addition to detection, binary classification of normal, of normal. Okay, for example, uh, the, the, ground, the green color represents the ground truth. The, uh, the red color uh, represents the detection results. So there's a um, match, match not, 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 not good. Okay, uh, ex, ex, uh, explainable artificial intelligence uh, the, uh, match the best. The overlap is 100%, almost 100%, okay? Uh, so the, uh, the ground truth with the detection results match the, match the best, okay? So uh, when, when uh, you, in medical imaging application, medical imaging application, when it's attribution such as uh, localization or disease tissues, in addition to detection binary, normal or abnormal. Okay. As skin, skin markings, a lot of example, X, XAI, a lot of example, by standard surgical ink markers cause significant re reduction in prediction accuracy, increasing the false positive rate by 40%. Use of surgical skin markers should be avoided in Demoscopic images intended for analysis by deep learning. This is also a form of out of distribution. XAI, explainable artificial intelligence, points to the specific cause of a mistake, while out of distribution detector only give binary, binary prediction of in distribution or out of distribution. So this, this is the results. Okay. Uh, White box, black box, XAI, that's the set of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the term black box is uh, mainly used for, used for labeling all those machine learning models that are from a mathematical point of view, very hard to explain and to be understood by experts. Um, in practical domains, it is important to highlight this, that convolutional neural networks based models, such as uh, GNN models, GNN family, or, 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 or CNN or DNN, DNN families, are the most difficult to understand by both, by both machine learning experts and specialists in the application area due to the the several transformations made to the input data. Uh, the white box, the white box term, understandable model and explainable artificial intelligence are used for are used for labeling all those machine learning models, providing results associated to their models that are easy to are easy to understand by experts in the application domain. Usually. These models provided a good trade-off between accuracy and uh, explainability. Uh, the terms understandable and inter interpretable are used for referring to all those models providing an um, exploration to experts in the application area. Uh, so this is the white box, white box uh, models, white box algorithm. Uh, the left is the model black box black box model or black box algorithms, such as RME sharp, okay, sensitivity analysis. Uh, white box and, and the black box also needs the uh, good exploration. Okay, R, RRPR means uh, white box forward pass to make a prediction, backward pass to compute a neuron Relevance values layer by layer, and finally obtain obtain input pixel level relevance. Our focus model compression by pruning away neurons or uh, collections with no relevance model compression. Okay. 
the, the first, last is the summary. Um, my research address address issues of safety and and uh, uh, efficient efficiency when machinery and deep learning models are deployed in safety safety critical systems. Uh, range from autonomous driven or IOV interlevel vehicles to medical imaging. I have discussed three interrelated topics: auto distribution detection, uh, model compression. Uh, especially uh, protein connection, protein neurons, and uh, explainable artificial intelligence uh, used for model compression, white box and, uh, and uh, black box. Okay, uh, the last one for used, uh, for used uh, uh, gray box, gray box, okay. As an outside of the medical imaging field, I would like to explore, explore Potential, potential applications of just technical techniques in medical imaging. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for perfect your invitation. Okay. Okay. So, thank Professor Wang for sharing his uh, deep thoughts in uh, out of distribution detection model compression and uh, uh, explain, explainable uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and the and the, about the medical imaging applications. So th th uh, that's the all of our workshop, uh, which is supported by China Computer F Federation Young Computer Scientists and Engineering Forum, uh, Shanghai. Uh, thank for all speakers again for your sharing, and uh, thank all attendees for your listening. At last. Uh, Please uh, uh, let us open the, the camera and take a, a photo online. Okay. Uh, please stop uh, sharing the screen, Professor Wang. Oh. Can, can you uh, stop sharing the screen and uh, I will take a, okay. a photo. Uh, 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 uh. It's okay. Um, no, st the, the screen is uh, okay. That That's okay. Oh, so we need, to, we need to change the background. Just change the background. Okay, the, use the conference. Um, that that's okay. We 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 take uh, wait a minute. It's okay. Okay. Uh, I, I have finished it. Okay. Th th that's the end of our workshop. Thank you, Professor Zhang, Professor Wan, and the Professor Chen, and other speakers and our attendees. Thank you, Professor Pei. Thank you, Professor Liu. Your meditation, okay? See you, Alex. Okay, see you. Thank you. Bye, 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 Thank bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.